You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. Whether it's for food, fuel, drinks, or snacks, about half of the U.S. population shops at a convenience store every day. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. Air quality is a cause for concern, not only locally, but globally. There are many causes of air pollution, but a culprit, a main culprit of that is transportation. In California, transport is responsible for more than 40% of greenhouse gas emissions and electric vehicles are seen as an important component to reduce emission. The Clean Energy and Pollution Reduction Act requires California to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% below 1990 levels by 2030 and to 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. What role do utilities play and how are they helping to meet these goals, both in terms of their own environmental performance and in terms of supporting the transportation sector. I'm Donovan Woods with the Fuels Institute. I'm joined by my co-host. Hey guys, I'm John Eichberger, Fuels Institute and Nax. And Donovan, I'm happy to be here today. Thank you for being here, John. Now, before we dive into it, I wanna note that things are a bit different today. We are working remotely from makeshift home recording studios, but still have the same high quality audio that we always have and you're accustomed to. Second, we are recording on April 21st, and that's important to state just in case there are any developments that change anything we're discussing today. But now, today, we are joined by our guest, Brittany Seats, the Director of Clean Transportation with the San Diego Gas and Electric. Our listeners should know that San Diego Gas and Electric is one of the country's most advanced utilities. Uh, They are one of the leaders in the vehicle to grid efforts, not only with fleets, but also with several pilot programs for residential consumers and light duty vehicles. Brittany, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So, Brittany, you know, California has been on the cutting edge of uh, pushing forward policies and initiatives to address air pollution and environmental protection. And obviously, the transportation sector and the utility sector are kind of right there, uh, front and center of the priorities. Can you kind of chat a little bit about uh, the San Diego Gas and Electrics position, some of the initiatives you guys are doing, and how it relates to the overall objective of addressing air pollution and climate in the California space? Absolutely. Um, Getting to be part of a clean transportation program in California is pretty exciting because, as you mentioned, we have so much policy in the state um, that's really driving us towards creating ways to clean up our air, both GHG emissions as well as local air emissions. Um, As we know, transportation makes up a huge part of that. In California alone, uh, emissions from transportation uh, contribute uh, uh, 40 percent of the greenhouse gas makeup, and it's even more so in San Diego. So at the utility, we are focused on how we can reduce those emissions through clean transportation. So we run a bunch of different infrastructure programs to help provide that electric vehicle infrastructure, the charging infrastructure that's needed to help accelerate EV adoption. Uh, As an example, we have already installed 3,000 chargers for multi-unit dwellings, which are condos and apartments um, and workplaces. Um, This program was called Power Your Drive. We finished installing those chargers um, mid-2019, and uh, we are continuing to build on that program. We filed at our commission another program to extend that since there's still significant demand for that. Um, But I don't want to forget about the commercial side. Um, We also have a program that we're rolling out now for medium-duty and heavy-duty vehicles. So that's everything from a Class 2 through a Class 8 vehicle. Um, and we're looking to help electrify at least 3,000 vehicles through that program. Um, we have a couple other uh, pilot infrastructure programs, um, and we continue to look how what programs we need to be uh, running to help meet those 2030 goals that you mentioned. So with the, obviously, convenience matters, deals with the convenience industry, convenience stores sell by 85% of the gas in the country, and we always view ourselves as kind of that transportation energy hub of the United States. So like 42 million fuel transactions a day, 160 million customers a day. So we start thinking about the transition to electrification. There's a heavy interest within the convenience industry to say, 
how do we get into that space? How do we make sure we're there to service our customers? Um, how do your programs working with the apartment complexes and the office spaces, how does that interact with the retail sector and the overall deployment of chargers to make sure that California customers have easy access and ready access to electricity for their vehicles when they need it? There's got to be a, I'm sure there's some sort of a balanced approach and kind of a strategy in that. Is there not? Absolutely. Um, so the programs I mentioned primarily are not public programs, um, but we think charging for the public is going to be critical to help accelerate EV adoption. So what you're talking about, that those chargers in, in the convenience centers, uh, charging that's available when people go to the grocery store. We don't yet have a program uh, that allows us to install in those places, but I can tell you this, my group is talking about that every day, and that will absolutely be a component of our next filing. We know that it's while the majority of people will probably fuel at home and potentially at work, um, we do know that you still need to have that public charging network uh, to get this industry off the ground. And I agree with you on that, that last spot because for EVs to become mass adoption, they're going to have to transition away from the more affluent single family home, two car garage families into those apartment dwellers who, even if you have a pretty robust charging infrastructure within an apartment complex, it's not going to satisfy everybody. And so that in market charging is going to be absolutely essential if EVs are going to gain market share. Absolutely. And we want so to make sure that we are not I, oh, uh, ahead, leaving please, please. any communities on the sideline. So just trying to transition just slightly away from just specifically the communities. You mentioned fleets, and I noticed something um, in one of the programs on your website that talked about how you're helping even with shuttles and, and airports. And uh, you mentioned earlier medium duty and heavy duty. How is that working? Um, I saw where it is a lot of shuttle buses and you're seeing them that run 50,000 miles a year. They're being able to come off of a, a strictly liquid fuel and going to electric vehicle format. Where does that stand? And, and you mentioned 3,000 vehicles, I think, on your last one of your comments that are going to be uh, implemented or 3,000 chargers. How is that going? What's the status? Is there any updates you can give us? Sure. Uh, we ran a couple pilot programs over the last year. We call them our priority review projects, where we focus on, we focused primarily on the medium duty, heavy duty sector. And as you mentioned, we did have a couple fleet ones for shuttles. So we're working with airport shuttles that have a fixed route. They go from their parking facility back and forth to the airport, moving many people uh, all day long. And so we thought, and, and also these shuttles are often and running in areas with higher pollution. So where the airports are, where the ports are, um, they're typically airports are part of um, a city where the emissions are already higher. So we think that these are really key critical um, segments that we want to tackle. Um, and as well as they educate folks because you have so many different people from all over the country riding in these shuttles and they are seeing firsthand how effective and well these electric vehicles drive and that they exist and that they can eventually roll them into their either lives and or businesses. Uh, we I also, like sorry. Go ahead, please. Nope. I, I was also just going to say on that medium uh, duty vehicle side, we also are working with uh, delivery fleets. So those fleets that are going out and delivering packages all day, idling in neighborhoods, we are also working right. with them. And I think you mentioned a key point there in terms of what consumers see, the observability. They're able to see something that work that's working, a technology that seems to be reliable. Um, I know for me, I don't want to try anything until I've seen someone else, you know, fail or have success. And I think consumers mostly are the same way, especially when it comes to something that could cost a minimum of twenty five, thirty thousand dollars for a new vehicle. Um, is that something that you keep in mind in terms of hoping for a further adoption? Because my, for my first time ever. I was in San Diego just this past uh, early January 2020, and it was a fantastic place to go. I went to the zoo for the first time, beautiful place. But I didn't see as many EVs as I just imagined I would, being from the East Coast. Is that something that you're expecting to happen where people do see it more often and you're going to see a transition more into uh, consumers purchasing more or looking more into hybrid technology? 
Uh, absolutely. Um, to give you an example, uh, at the utility, part of our education and outreach program is to run ride and drives. We find these to be the most successful marketing tool that we have. If I can get someone to sit down in an electric vehicle, and that's any model, that goes starting you know, at the, the lower end uh, on the cost specter models all the way up through a Tesla or a Jaguar I-Pace. Once someone gets into that electric vehicle, they realize that in many instances, the performance is better. It drives better than an ICE com uh, a, a internal combustion vehicle and that it's accessible. Um, so we find that those are where we want to spend our marketing dollars because that's where we get the highest level of interest and conversion. And I agree with you, Brittany. I'm, I've driven several electric vehicles. I'm a, I love cars. It's what I, I do. It's my passion. And they are... Ex unbelievably fun. Even the lower powered ones are so quick off the line. They're so zippy. They are truly an experience. And you're right. If people can touch and feel it and experience it more, their openness and their acceptance of the technology will grow with, without a doubt. Um, I want to shift a little bit. I, before I was told everybody has to stay at home, I was on an airplane every week and I was giving somewhere between 30 and 50 presentations a year. And my presentation is usually about the future transportation and there's a big chunk on the electrification of the transportation market. <clears throat> and I get questions from the audience and they're almost always the same question. So I'm going to throw them to you and I'll let you parry them back because I have a feeling I know the answers, but I'd love to hear it from you. Um, first question is, well, John, you know, if we go electric, now we're just using coal-fired power plants. How is that cleaner? That's one question. The second question is, <laughs> is the grid even able to generate enough power to support the electrified vehicles? And third is the infrastructure, the transmission system, uh, up to speed to be able to handle the additional load demands. Um, I try to give them reassurances as to what I think is, but I'd love to hear what uh, your perspective is on those three, what I kind of consider red herring questions, but let's go ahead and put the red herrings to bed. Sure. We, we get these questions all the time. Um, I might start from the, the last one first. Uh, first off, this is not going to happen overnight. It's not like, you know, 2 million vehicles are going to show up in California in two years. This is going to be a slower trickle and the systems are going to build with them. Um, at this point, we don't have concerns about our system being able to meet those needs. Um, jumping back to the first question, and you'll have to remember, remind me of the second question, but the first question you had talked about the renewables. So... At this point in Calif in our territory at SDG&E, we have over 40% renewables on our grid. And also in California, and I know this is California specific, um, there is we don't use coal. So we are able to power our vehicles with over 40% renewable energy. We also are able to drive when people charge their vehicles um, by designing innovative rates that push people to charge at certain times. And those times where we want you to charge are when the grid isn't being utilized, as well as when there's excess renewables online. So we can design those rates to push you to charge at, say, 10 in the morning when you are um, either at home or at work, your car is idle, it's sitting there, and the sun is shining in California, um, and we'll direct you to, to charge at that time with a, with a, a price that will make you want to charge and I don't so remember this, the second question. So the second and third kind of go hand in hand. One was on capacity to generate, and the other one was on transmission system reliability. Um, there's been a lot of stories in the news in the last year or stuff or so about the uh, fragility of the transmission system. There's concerns. Is it able to deliver or will it be able to modernize and upgrade as EVs come online so that we don't have any disruption in service? Um, yes, it absolutely will. We will have to continue to um, manage when people uh, charge, and we can do that again through rates. Um, but again, this is going to be, as the adoption increases, we will increase the, the transmission system to handle this. But again, we'll still want to make sure that we're sending signals so that people are charging when we want them to, when, again, there's less use on the grid or when there's renewables available. Well, Donovan, it sounds like I am saying uh, along the same lines as Brittany is, so I feel like I've been answering the questions appropriately, which is always a good thing. I never like asking people to validate my answers when they tell me something that I said wrong. I really don't like that, so this is good. I feel I feel good about this. 
I'm glad I can support you. Thank you. <laughs> now, Brittany, are there things that, because uh, we work with another organization we, we um, have had, actually her name is Erica Myers. We've had her on our podcast several times now. Um, and they have a publication that kind of, um, with uh, SEPA, and they have a publication that kind of goes through the different utilities throughout the country and where they're ranked in terms of their readiness, as it were, for a major um, influx of electric vehicles. And again, San Diego ranks at the top level of those tiers. What are some of the things that other areas could learn from you guys? What have you done that's just so different that other uh, utilities in different parts of the country haven't been able to do, don't have the support for? What makes you so different? Um, I would say uh, a couple things. One, we have state policy really pushing this. Um, and so we've all had to adapt. Two, we have a management uh, at SDG&E that wants us to be innovative, um, which a lot of people don't always think of the utility as being innovative. But my group is like a small startup within a larger utility. And so while we, are, we do have a regulatory body um, that regulates everything that we do, we are given the go ahead from our management to think of those outside of the box ways to um, help grow this industry. Um, so I would say that those two things really allow us to um, prepare. We know this is coming, prepare for it and see how we can be a leader in it. So I'm encouraged every day to, to take steps that show how we're, we're really driving this, not just participating, but driving it. So I'd like to transition back since so many of our uh, listeners are in the convenience space. You know, I've been spending the last year or so talking to a lot of convenience retailers about their opportunities for installing chargers and some of the response I get again, I'm, I'm throwing out questions I'm getting from the, from the market or, you know, my utility won't work with me to do this. My utility is, they, they won't help me. They won't, they are not providing me make ready services. And my response has always been, well, first of all, have you asked them? Have you spoken to them? Um, from your perspective, what is the opportunity available for partnering between your utility, other utilities, and retailers that want to get into deploying chargers? Is there a path forward for that type of collaborative approach to make sure that the customers are being served where they need to be served? Absolutely. Um, I've been on many panels where I've said it and I've heard every utility um, across the nation say it is always reach out early to your utility to see what programs they have in existence and to see what they can offer. Um, I would also say that something that's been really interesting us and that we are, we are researching and looking into is we think that perhaps the utility um, could always be there or the, we call it the make ready. That's the pipes and wires that, that are underground that will help you support the charging infrastructure. That the side that is on the utility side, so what we typically do are the, the service lines and the drop lines, that that would always be covered by your utility. We're not currently allowed to do that, but we think that's an interesting way of engaging those type of customers that... Um, that want to install chargers on their on their sites. Um, the other thing is, you know, talk. We are always listening to our customers. What do our customers want? Um, we're there to serve customer need. So, if what are the barriers to those customers, and how can we break them down? And the final thing I would mention is, when you're talking to the utility, you're probably calling their new business line, the the line where when you're setting, you're building a building and you need to be connected. Always start there, but ask them if they have a clean transportation department. Um, that's what we have. So I don't typically work with folks that are um, just trying to connect to the grid and have a third party come in and provide the charging. But my group is always happy to talk to those customers. So oftentimes the utility will have a separate department that really just focuses on clean transportation programs rather than just the connection. Ask your utility who that is. And if you could have a conversation directly with that group, you might learn about a program that's in the works that might uh, satisfy your needs that might have a rebate program to pick up some of the costs or might have an end to end program where they'll pick up all the costs. It is amazing how answers to a lot of these questions are simple. It's pick up a phone and call somebody, um, contact somebody, talk to them, start a discussion and a dialogue. I, I run into so many people who no matter what the topic is, like, well, they're not going to work with me, so I'm not going to bother. 
And I think what you just said is, is spot on. You know, you never know what opportunities really are available to you until you start talking to people about it. Start asking the questions and seeing what can be done. Think about what is possible, not what is impossible. And you can open up a lot of doors that way as a, as a business owner. Absolutely. We want to be responsive to our customers' needs. That's what the utility, we're here to serve customers. Well, perfect. We I couldn't have wrapped that any better. We we love the enthusiasm you have for working with everyone, Brittany, and I'm sure uh, our listeners will appreciate that as well. Uh, we thank you for being with us today, Brittany. It was a treat to have you. We're so happy that you were able to finally get on our, our schedules and everything matched up. And we thank you for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.